Hello, and welcome to another round of Hungry for History. I'm Luciana Spraker with the City of Savannah Municipal Archives. I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, Anne Solen Bayan, Assistant Curator at the Telfair of Museums. Since joining the Telfair in April 2020, Anne Solen has curated two exhibitions, Vehicles of Change and Curator's Choice. Prior to joining the Telfair, she studied 19th and early 20th century European and American art at the Williams College Graduate Program in the History of Art. Her graduate paper, The Necessities of Extremes and Contrasts, Architecture, Race, Geometry, and Geometry in Notre Dame de Paris, explored how the creation of new gargoyles and chimeras during the mid 19th century restoration at the Notre Dame Cathedral in France was motivated by issues of race and aesthetics. Anne Solène has previously worked at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute, and the Williams College Museum of Art in Williamstown, Massachusetts. She studied art history at the Sorbonne in Paris and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in film production and art history from Concordia University in Montreal, and a Master of Arts in the History of Art from the Williams College Clark Art Institute joint program. If you follow along with the Municipal Archives at all, you will know that we have been embarking on a recent series called the Autos in the Archives, which was inspired by the collaboration with Anne Solen and the Telfair and us as part of their exhibit, Vehicles of Change. We have been diving into our photographic collections to reflect on the automobile and Savannah's history as a supplement to their exhibition. As part of that outreach, we have asked Anne Solen to join us today to talk more about Telfair's exhibit and specifically, Vehicles of Change, How the Automobile Fueled the Civil Rights Movement. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne Solen with a big thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Luciana, and thank you to the City of Savannah Municipal Archives for inviting me to talk about my exhibition, Vehicles of Change, an exhibition of 20th century photographs by American artists in Telfair Museum's permanent collection. My presentation today Vehicles of Change, How the Automobile Fueled the Civil Rights Movement, will first cover the exhibition broadly before turning to one of its themes. Specifically, I'll be discussing the way automobiles were instrumental in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But before we delve into that, I want to start by sharing how I came to uh, conceive of this exhibition and this particular topic. It was, strangely enough, through this quote by the French philosopher and semiotician Roland Barthes, in his mythologies from 1957, Bart makes this surprising claim. Quote, I think the cars today are almost the exact equivalent of the great Gothic cathedrals. I mean, the supreme creation of an era conceived with passion by unknown artists and consumed in image, if not in usage by a whole population, end quote. While cars may not seem to have a great deal in common with those towering 12th century religious structures made of stained glass windows, the comparison prompted me to think of cars beyond their utility. It encouraged me to think of automobiles first as symbols, and second, it prompted me to think about the ways in which they've become central organizing forces within society. Many works in Telfair Museum's collection, and these are just two examples, illustrate how motor vehicles have fundamentally and irrevocably transformed our landscapes. They stimulated the growth of related industries like roadside hotels and restaurants, for instance, connected rural and urban air, uh, centers and led to the creation of the highway system that we still rely on today. In this way, the car was imbued with symbolism. It embodied a vision of America where unconquerable distances can suddenly be conquered, where people could be connected in unprecedented ways, where the individual could go where she wanted, when she wanted. It was understood as a promise of increased independence, freedom, choice, and mobility. It may be difficult for us today to fully comprehend the kind of unprecedented mobility that cars and buses afforded, especially once dependable roads and highways became a matter of fact, um, and cars became widely available and more affordable in the second half of the 20th century. These vehicles allowed for new freedoms and novel possibilities for leisure, work, and human interaction. Uh, and here I've included three photographs from the exhibition by the artist Joan Lifton. Lifton, who photographed the drive-in in the United States for over 20 years, thought of outdoor theaters as places that afforded a special kind of socialization 
human connection, entertainment, and self-expression. This early Chevrolet advertisement notably speaks to the ways in which cars were thought of as ultimate promoters of human potential. This ad is entitled Man's Conquest of Time, and it shows a simplified visual progression from Egyptian times where two men are shown carrying their charges on foot to a man ostensibly a medieval peasant walking by a bull-drawn cart to a Native American horse-drawn cart to trains and of course what is presented as the pinnacle of mobility the end point of this evolution the car. This ad reveals the mythologizing that occurred around automobiles and specifically the way that mobility was associated to things like culture, progress, civilization. It notably reads, quote, the progress of mankind from the earliest recorded ages has been marked by a ceaseless struggle against the limitations of time and space. Civilization is mutual interchange of thought and the product of thought. This interchange demands transportation, hence the development of civilization has paralleled the improvements in transportation, end quote. This sentiment wasn't just expressed in early car advertisements. Freedom, mobility, and self-discovery would be tied together throughout the century and would become embedded in our culture, specifically in the wake of century-defining texts like Jack Kerouac's On the Road, a novel about a group of carefree youths who shun moral and social codes and roam the country by car. This novel from 1957 explicitly connects individuality, creativity, sexuality, and freedom to the newfound mobility afforded by automobiles. This 1994 edition of the novel features the following uh, rave review, quote, the explosive bestseller that tells all about today's wild youth and their frenetic search for experience and sensation, end quote. A number of photographs in Telfer's permanent collection speak to that particular zeitgeist. This untitled photograph by Bruce Davidson from 1959 immediately, immediately calls to mind the types of male youths described by Kerouac in On the Road. This photo belongs to Davidson's Brooklyn Gang series, a group of images that documented the lives of the Jokers, a teenage gang in Brooklyn, New York. In this image, Davidson captured Jimmy, whose friends called him the James Dean of the group posing next to his car with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, shirtless and covered in car grease, Jimmy assertively scrubs his hands with a sullied rag. Through this photograph, sorry, this photograph and others from the series, Davidson captured the way that car culture and youth culture became completely intertwined in this era. We could also look at another photograph in Telfair's permanent collection by American uh, photographer Elaine Mays, entitled Bus, Salt, Lake, Auto Landscape. A Greyhound bus sleekly traverses the highway, a reminder of the daunting undertaking that was the building of the interstate highway system that started in 1956 and the incredible popularity of Greyhound buses, which offered low cost trips throughout the country. Elaine Mays took this photograph after securing a national endowment for the Arts Fellowship in 1971. She decided to use the fellowship to embark on an artistic journey on the road, she photographed landscapes and people seen through her moving car, and she didn't always look through the viewfinder. This image belongs to her auto landscape series, which has since been lauded as an important record of the automobile-centric world of the 1970s. This Greyhound advertisement, although from a much earlier, earlier era, conveys the wonder and excitement surrounding the advent of bus travel. A smiling modern young woman boldly claims, now I know how Columbus felt, I've discovered America. The subsequent text exalts the cost effectiveness of bus travel and the extraordinary possibilities of unhindered exploration and discovery. These idealistic and glamorous visions of American automobility, while suited to the simplified world of advertisement and consumer culture, tell just one part of this broader history of American automobility in the second half of the 20th century. I wanna turn now to a different photograph also a depiction of a Greyhound bus, but in a completely different historical context. This is another untitled photograph by Bruce Davidson, the same artist who photographed uh, Jimmy a few slides earlier, but taken in 1961, when the young photographer was on assignment for the New York Times, tasked with documenting the civil rights protest across the country. Davidson joined a group of freedom riders who were traveling from Montgomery, Alabama, where this photograph was taken, to Jackson, Mississippi. The riders, as they were called, 
were protesting racial segregation and transportation by peacefully traveling on Greyhound buses throughout the South. Because the riders were often met with incredible acts of violence, in some cases mobs burned their buses and physically assaulted them, the National Guard was sent to escort the protesters throughout uh, their travels. And this is what you're looking at here. This image suggests an incredibly tense scene. My eye is immediately drawn to the guards outside the window. The ones captured in motion, looking back. Has some ominous disruption captured their attention? Is danger approaching? What I find particularly intriguing about this photograph is the way it collapses easy distinctions between inside and outside, between safety and danger. A sense of dread and imminent threat permeates the image on both sides of the glass window. So while it's technically true that Americans gained certain freedoms through the automobile, Jim Crow segregation in the US meant that freedom and mobility would come to mean radically different things to white and black Americans. With the advent of the highway system and network, legally enforced segregation in the country grew to include every type of business that was connected to the automobile, including restaurants, motels, gas stations, bus stations, and even parking lots. And here I've included a photograph of a restaurant sign that declares we cater to white trade only. Not only did rules for black travelers vary from state to state, but certain rules were informal, known and enforced by local residents and officers. This made traveling incredibly onerous and dangerous for black travelers. These hardships led to the advent of a series of documents, guidebooks of sorts, which included, for instance, a book called Travel, Gu Sorry, Travel Guide, which advertised, quote, vacation and recreation without humiliation. And the Green Book, perhaps the most famous example. One testimony from the time emphatically stated, quote, we obtained the most important book needed for Negroes who traveled anywhere in the United States. It was called the Green Book. The Green Book was the Bible of every Negro highway traveler in the 1950s and early 60s. You literally didn't dare leave home without it. The Green Book, or the Negro Motorist Green Book, was named after its founders, Victor and Anna Green, in 1936. The book listed things like the, the Black businesses and white businesses that travelers could safe safely attempt to patronize for food, restrooms, uh, and gas. And it noted where sunset towns were located throughout the country. Uh, these were municipalities that banned Black people after the sunset by threatening so-called trespassers with violence and um, even death. It also included a safe driving rule section um, to in part warn black drivers of unofficial restrictions that if not heeded could lead to harassment and violence. An interesting part um, of this history that I discovered while researching this project is that segregation and transportation was one of the most resented forms of discrimination. And as a result, individuals were frequently challenging segregation on public transportation though we don't often hear about these individuals beyond the most famous cases. Starting with the Jim Crow cars, the cars on trains that were reserved for black passengers, rail railroad employees, drunk uh, white people, uh, prisoners, and even sometimes livestock. And continuing with segregation on streetcars and later buses, the injustice of segregation was particularly felt in the course of travel. Complaints lodged during this time reveal how unsanitary and arduous it could be for Black tra travelers to be in a segregated car. Additionally, some complaints also emphasize that Black travelers felt strongly about the unfairness of ticket prices. For instance, in 1888, a petition in Georgia filed by prominent Black Americans argued for equal accommodations for equal money. They stated in their complaint, during the days of slavery, colored people had paid only one half the fares that white people paid. And that after the war, the railroad required colored people to ride in a second class car, but stopped selling them tickets at half prices. In light of all this, I've come to see it as no accident that one of the most important Supreme Court cases related to segregation would revolve around transportation. Plessy versus Ferguson from 1897, sorry, 96, a Supreme Court decision based on a railroad case effectively legalized Jim Crow segregation. Beyond the very famous Plessy case, records show that countless individuals, organizations like the NAACP, civil rights leaders frequently challenged segregation and transportation in and out of the courtroom. As Penn professor and history scholar Mia Bay argues in her recent book, 
Traveling Black, A Story of Race and Resistance, published this year, quote, the desegregation of the South's buses and other common carriers would not be achieved by any single legal victory or heroic act of resistance. It would require a long series of lawsuits, challenging segregation on buses, trains, and even airplanes, as well as discrimination in dining cars, bus terminals, railroad station waiting rooms, railway dining cars, airports, hotels, roadside restaurants, and other accommodations, end quote. Outside of the courtroom, automobiles were often used as protest tools in the fight to end segregation. In fact, car ownership was critical to the success of many civil rights initiatives. Most famously, in 1955, Black protesters in Montgomery, Alabama, instigated the Montgomery bus boycott after Rosa Parks was arrested and fined for refusing to relinquish her seat to a white traveler. Protesters stopped riding segregated buses and sadly designed a free ride system to exert pressure on the city. Thanks to these free rides, those who supported the boycott were able to get to work and travel throughout the city without using the official bus lines, bringing the public transportation system that relied on its black customers to a halt. This remarkable coordinated initiative lasted 381 days and led to the integration of Montgomery's buses in December of 1956. Uh, while the image on the right of a young woman hailing a free ride is from a similar bus boycott, but in Florida, the image on the left depicts Martin Luther King helping a group of women in a, uh, into a volunteer's automobile during the Montgomery bus boycott. Vehicles proved essential, even outside of boycotts and freedom rides. As Gretchen Soren argued in Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights from 2020, quote, the car helped make the civil rights movement possible in a segregated world in which the participants needed the ability to travel to different cities quickly and safely, end quote. Indeed, when black travelers landed in a city and needed to grab a cab to get to a hotel or elsewhere, it could be an arduous process to locate a taxi willing to assist them. Hotel shuttles would typically not transport black passengers and African-American cab companies were often prohibited from taking passengers to and from the airport. Although of course this varied from state to state. Black travelers could end up completely stranded. One of the solutions was rental cars, uh, which allowed for, conveniently, for convenient and relatively safe methods of transportation for civil rights leaders across the country. I want to start to close this presentation by turning to a series of photographs by Frederick Baldwin in Telfer's permanent collection. These works on view in the exhibition were taken at the height, the height of the civil rights movement in Savannah and provide yet another example of how the automobile played a crucial role in this time period. Baldwin, a freelance photographer who had just spent six years abroad, returned to Savannah in 1963 to visit family. Immediately upon his arrival, he recalls encountering these kinds of scenes and describes an overwhelming feeling of shock at finding the city on the cusp of a major revolution. He witnessed about 400 protesters marching down Bull Street, waving American flags and carrying signs, freedom or death. The photograph on the right shows 19 year old Benjamin Van Clark leading a group from City Hall down Bull Street to Wright Square, where fellow civil rights leader Hosea Williams addressed demonstrators. While attempts to desegregate the city had occurred well before the 1960s, the years between 1960 and 1963 proved critical. In March of 1960, Black students staged sit-ins at whites-only dining areas on Broughton Street, in Broughton Street businesses, which ignited an organized movement, notably led by WW Law. The group demanded the desegregation of facilities, the use of courtesy titles, so Mr. and Mrs., as opposed to the derogatory boy or girl, and the hiring of Black clerks and managers in retail. This led to the Broughton Street boycott and a number of protests, kneel-ins, and wait-ins at Tybee Beach. But gains and losses you know, were made in these three years. For instance, the Savannah bus line agreed to begin hiring Black drivers in 1961, and the city agreed in October of 1961 to desegregate parks, swimming pools, buses, and restaurants. However, in 1963, some businesses reneged on this agreement and mass protests like the ones witnessed by Fred Baldwin overtook the city once again. 
Baldwin quickly befriended Hosea Williams and worked as a volunteer photographer for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC. And I've included a photograph here of Hosea Williams attempting to convince a group of longshoremen to register a vote. In this capacity, Baldwin followed and photographed now famous Savannah heroes like Benjamin Van Clark, Lester Hankerson, uh, shown here in the trench coat on the left and right, uh, Otis Johnson and Henry Brownlee as they attempted to register black voters. On the left here, Hankerson is shown in the midst of what appears to be an impassioned conversation with a captivated potential voter. Indeed, Hankerson stood out as a formidable force looking for potential voters in bars, like we see on the right, uh, on street corners and union halls. What one finds when looking through photographs, videos, and records of, this, of the time is that this car uh, photographed here, which activists affectionately called the ballot bus, which was really a four-door black Dodge, was instrumental in their efforts. To convince unregistered Black Savanians to vote, Hankerson, Brownlee, Williams, and so many others offered free rides to the courthouse. The words painted on the ballot bus read, vote, free ride, no excuses. In fact, Benjamin Van Clark recalled how Hankerson, in particular, quote, loved that ballot bus. I've seen him go on the corner and grab dudes, say, look here, man, you registered to vote? No, come on, get in. Lester, I can't go nowhere with you right now. And then in all caps, you are gonna get in here. Activists helped register an unprecedented number of voters. In 1962, over 17,000 black voters had been registered. That represented 57% of all adult African-Americans in the city. This leverage granted black Savanians significant influence in their fight to desegregate the city and gave them sway in government elections. On October 1st, 1963, the city of Savannah finally desegregated public and private facilities. This occurred a whole eight months before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So I started this presentation by discussing all the ways in which vehicles were imbued with larger than life ideals. They are viewed as tools and symbols of great new freedoms and as signs that the United States is a place of progress, the site of an advanced civilization. And while vehicles empowered many and transformed a number of facets of American society, cars would be used to greatest effect by Black Americans, whose mobility had been tightly controlled and surveilled since they were enslaved and brought to the United States. It was Black drivers and civil rights protesters, the riders, the ballot bus drivers or boycott participants, and even those ordinary Black travelers who risked great harm driving across the country, who fueled who truly fueled the civil rights movement and helped claim those ideals for their community and society more broadly. Thank you. Thank you, Anselin. Um, that, that's really, to me, fascinating to see the images of Savannah and the ballot bus. And um, I think you've seen a, a really great uh, film that was taken. I think it was called Act Now, where they actually show um, Big Lester and Hosea in action going out with the ballot bus and rounding up people and encouraging them to go register. So if, if people haven't seen that video, it's available on YouTube. And it's really great to see see them in action with this vehicle and, and making making big changes in the community through automobiles. Totally. Um, yeah. it, it also includes at the end this um, this great moment where Benjamin Van Clark is sort of giving a sermon, but it's more of a rallying cry in, uh, in a church. And it's really, really powerful. It is. Yeah. And for people who also just like to see Savannah at different points in history, it's, it's a really um, fascinating um, footage of Savannah in the 1960s, um, different areas of town, uh, West Broad Street, which is now Martin Luther mm -hmm. Boulevard, Montgomery Street, Forsyth Park. So it's a fascinating film. Um, I just really want to thank you and the Telfair for reaching out to us when you started working on this because it forced us to look at our collections differently. I think we don't really realize how much the automobile has impacted um, every facet of, of our life. And um, here at the Municipal Archives, 
we don't necessarily catalog all our photographs in a way that made it easy for us to find um, cars. And once we started looking at um, the cars, you know, there, we found some really fascinating images of automobiles and started looking at them in terms of what were pivotal moments in history for Savannah that were like turning points because of the automobile. And some of the themes that have come out in our own series, um, you know, are things like infrastructure improvements and then historic preservation and how those two things interact together, conflict sometimes. Um, again, segregation and desegregation themes. Um, suburban development and pushing out, but then urban sprawl problems that come with that. So it's been really good exercise for us that's come out of this collaboration to really think about how, you know, cars just have, are, are throughout, you know, everything. And, but we take them for granted. They are so ingrained in our culture that we don't realize how important they are to um, 20th century history. Exactly. And it's been really a pleasure to work with you because I really wanted this exhibition to feature Savannah heavily, but you know, the collection didn't necessarily allow for that. And so it's been such a great way to um, create links to your initiative and show these images in conjunction with these Fel Frederick Baldwin works, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Frederick Baldwin's photographs are great. And if people are not familiar with his work, I definitely encourage them to come to the Tell Fair and then follow up and look at the book that you guys published mm -hmm. of his work because his photographs are uh, are really phenomenal from, from uh, the work he did during the Civil Rights Movement. So, well, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And um, if people haven't gotten out to see your exhibit, tell us uh, when is it going to be on view still? So, it's on view until August 27 of this year. Um, yeah, but we have some, um, you know, articles and things online, so it lives on. <laughs> okay, so the image, the stuff online will stay up after August 27. Yeah. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you um, in the future for another collaboration. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.